chicka wow wow. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. So good to see you guys this morning. It's funny, like everybody's on this side and nobody on this side. But uh, uh, if you're new uh, online or here this morning, my name is Bobby Lepine. I serve as lead pastor. This is my beautiful wife, Robin, and she's been working with me in this series that we are in uh, our last week called The Vow, uh, where we're talking about four promises, commitments that we need to make if we're going to have marriages that endure the long haul. And so today we're going to be talking about the vow of physical intimacy. Everybody say sex. So physical intimacy, sex for life. And uh, how many of you guys have ever been, or how many of you have ever been taught about sex in church? Wow. Okay, so this is new terrain, one. Uh, so we're going to say some things today. She has, because she's been with me, and I refuse to not teach on the whole Word of God. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so anyway, folks, before we go into our message this morning, I just want to thank you guys for, you know, showing up to church is a big thing. You know, COVID has really, like an atomic bomb, affected churches worldwide. And, uh, you know, I think we're on the beginning of beginning to be able to rebuild and open, open up to new people coming in. So, um, again, we're just thankful for you and also those of you who are watching online. So anyway, before we go into our message, I'd like to ask you to take out your bulletins and take out this Connect card and wave it at me. So if you're online, you can also download one there and print it online. But uh, if you would, um, if you're new, if you'd give your name, phone, etc., cetera, uh, let us know how many, if this is your first or second visit, how you heard about us, uh, and then any prayer requests or comments you might have. Uh, if you're new, we'd appreciate you bringing these to the Connect Center at the end of the service. Turn them in, and we have a free gift for you. Um, if you're not new, we, again, as you guys know, uh, we meet together here, uh, some of us to pray from 5.30 to 6.30 every Wednesday, and if you've got a prayer request, please put it down because we'd love to pray for you. Uh, beyond that, on the announcement sheet, you will see beyond the connection card, we'd like to ask you, if you're new, to go to our Facebook page and like our page, that's Bridge. Uh, Church Pensacola, and then if you would like to stay connected um, and receive updates weekly, uh, if you would text the words "the loop" to ninety-seven thousand, that will opt you into our text system. Uh, we don't abuse that. If you would, res uh, when you get a, a, a response saying that you've been opted in, if you would reply with your name, that'll help us to connect a name with a number. Finally, we have, like I said, Wednesday night prayer, and that's a, just a simple time, one hour where we worship, you know, we sit, we worship, uh, who, however you want to worship, and then the last 15 minutes we come together to pray for the needs of the church. So, uh, before we get into our message, so today we are getting into uh, a subject as the little video showed, that very few churches are willing to address. Um, I had somebody that just this week who is not churched, and uh, he, a he asked me, he said, does the Bible really talk about sex? And I said, absolutely. Tune in on Sunday morning, because I knew I couldn't get him to come to church, but <laughs> I said, tune in, uh, and we'll talk about what the Bible has to say. So before we do that, though, guys, I want to... Uh, since we're finishing our series this Sunday, next Sunday we're starting a new series. Uh, I'm going to be uh, doing this series called Mastermind, where we're talking about if you can take control of your thoughts, you can take control of your life. Your thoughts are a direct connection to your life. So we'll be doing, starting that next Sunday. But uh, anyway, so I'd like to start with something funny, and I found a joke that... Uh, is clean but has to do with sex. So you guys ready and ready to laugh even if it's not funny? Perhaps. Terrible. 
All right. So there is this guy that was fit, feeling ill. So he went to the doctor and he said, doctor, I'm feeling sick. The doctor checked him out and ran some tests. And the doctor said, I've got bad news for you. You've only got 18 hours left to live. The guy was devastated. He went home and told his wife. And they cried together. And they prayed together. And about three hours into it, he said, you know, honey, I've only got 15 hours left to live. Would you mind if we just made love? And she said, my gosh, of course not. Let's be together. And they were together, and they were very intimate, and they felt close. And it was good. And they continued to embrace, and time went on. He looked at his wife a little later, and he said, honey, I've only got about eight hours left to live. Do you mind if maybe one more time we could be together? And she said, oh, sweetie, that would be great. I would love to. And so they were again together, and they felt close. The time kept going on. It was bedtime. They kissed each other goodnight and went to bed, and the guy couldn't sleep. About three hours left of his life, he was thinking. It was the middle of the night, and he's looking at his watch, and he's thinking to himself, I've only got three hours left to live. So he reaches over and he taps his wife on the shoulder and he wakes her up and he says, "Hun, i I've got only three hours left to live. And she said, uh-huh, we've already been together twice. We're not going to be together a third time because I have to get up in the morning and you don't. <laughs> I like it. Uh, definitely. All right, guys, you ready to receive from the Word today? Let's take out our outlines and something to write with, and we're going to pray and dive in. Father, we just thank you this morning that, Lord, we can uh, have joyous, free hearts here, Lord. We can laugh, we can learn, Lord, we can love and love you and love one another. And God, we just thank you for the simplicity of being the church. Lord, that we are the church. And uh, Lord, we just thank you, God, for everything you're going to do this morning. Lord, I pray with Robin that every single person, God, whether here uh, physically or online, uh, that they would truly, truly receive something, Father. And uh, that, Lord, there would be something that they come away with that they never forget. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Again, everybody said amen. Amen. All right, guys, so to get started, I want to do a real quick review. Um, as I said, we've been talking about four vows that we need to make, promises that we need to make just four, that these four will carry us to a marriage that will last for our life. And so the first vow, I want you to say it with me. I think it's on your outline. Say, I vow God will be my first priority and my spouse my second. The second vow, I vow to always pursue my number two, my spouse. Third, I vow our marriage will be about we and not about me. And then finally today, I vow to make physical intimacy a priority in our marriage. So whether you are here and you are single or you're married, if you're single and you plan to be remarried, my hope and our, our prayer is that you would take these vows to heart in whatever relationship you go into. If you're here and you're uh, married, that you would apply these things and that they would truly make a difference. But again, you know, this vow that we're talking about today uh, to make physical intimacy uh, a priority in our marriage is something, guys, that as we're going to see, applies whether you're in your 20s, in your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. I believe that you can have close physical intimacy in your 80s. And I even believe beyond that. You know, I love where in the uh, book of Joshua, you see Caleb and Joshua. And uh, Caleb says, you know, let me go to war because they're picking out the men to go to war. 
and uh, he's in his 80s, and he says, I am just as strong and just as vigorous as I was when I was a young man. And so uh, how many of you guys would say amen to that? I'll, I'll take that. So, uh, so anyway, guys, listen, uh, you know, we're, I want to start out and I want to talk about um, where and how we often begin in learning about sex. You know, for all, everyone in this room, there's a beginning point where you started to learn about sex. And more likely than not, it was not from the Bible. Let me just ask for a show of hands. Does any, has anybody here, their first experience learning about sex was the Bible? Nobody. And so, <laughs> nobody. So this is quite important that we talk about this in church. And, uh, and the reason why is because, you know, it's vital that we really understand what we learned and where we learned it from because most of us have to unravel that as we go into adulthood. And so I want to just start and let uh, Robin talk about where, where did you first learn about sex and, and uh, where and how did you first learn about sex? Well, unfortunately, and you know this, and we need to know this, um, I was sexually abused as a child, so I didn't really understand about sex from that abuse, right. but that was my first experience with it. Right. Now, learning about it, you know, in school, we learned about it in home ec. Um, I, we learned about it, you know, from my parents um, talking to us, mainly my mom, but uh, experiencing and learning about it to me were two different things. Right. And so... Um, <clears throat> that, you know, again, so that's just kind of my story in a very small nutshell about how I first learned about it. Um, and then, of course, my first, you know, when I was uh, about 11 years old, um, you know, I ran into some horrific pornography. That was another experience yep. in learning about it, but it was all the wrong way of learning about it. Yep. And so, unfortunately... Pornography is so pervasive in our culture and in our world that I, I think that there's many of us that that's how we first learn about it and maybe experience it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, but it's not really, if, but, but because there's so much falsehood in that dynamic, that's not really learning about it. No. But I did do a Bible study called the Song of Solomon too when I was in my 40s and I learned a lot, an awful lot more about it then which will be coming from today um, yeah. song of songs it, song of solomon song of songs i can say for me uh i had a <laughs> a horrific introduction to sex in that i accidentally walked in on my parents how many of you guys know that's the worst of worst of worst i mean it's horrifying <laughs> and so it was horrific and horrifying and i remember i was quite like nine years old and I was just like, oh, my gosh. But you know what was funny is that I went into my room, and we used to have these things called world book encyclopedias. So there's no such thing as encyclopedias anymore. Online but, uh, there are. Well, they're online. But yes. uh, So I went to my world book encyclopedia and found sex. And so I, my first really learning about it was from the world book encyclopedia. Uh, sad to say, like Robin... Uh, my next exposure was at 11 years old, and it's, it's an interesting thing. That's usually where most people start learning about sex is around uh, 10 to 12 years old. But anyway, I was in Austin, Texas, and um, I'll never forget it. We were staying in a La Quinta Inn in Austin, Texas, and I was, like I said, about 11 years old. And I went into the lobby and over to the side away from the um, the uh, checkout, check-in desk, was a rack of magazines. And it just so happened they had pornographic magazines. Well, my little 11-year-old brain, you know, they say curiosity kills the cat. Well, curiosity will do some damage to you if you're not uh, prepared um, or expecting it. But anyway, I, I picked up one of those magazines, and I was shocked. But you know, sadly, you know, as the years went on in my, in my youth, you know, that's really where I learned 
And so I became a Christian my freshman year of college. And, you know, the sin, my sin of the past was under the blood of Christ. But one thing that I have learned is that the hardwiring, a lot of the hardwiring in our emotional life, which includes our, you know, our view of sex and everything else, carries over, unfortunately, into our Christian life. And just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that you see uh, sex as it is described in the Bible and as it should be. You going to say? No, and I'm just also going to say that um, it takes, <clears throat> for me, I've had to have a lot of ministry to get the ugliness, I call it like the tar, out of my soul from the experience of when I was even younger than you, and I had forgotten about this until just now, you know, running into playing outside, right? And then somebody had thrown some horrific pornography into a creek, and I was playing there, and I saw it. It was just like what you said. Yep. And it, it literally, it's something that, um, it, 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 it imprints you. I, oh, I, don't, I can't yep. think of anything that imprints a human soul more than pornography. Uh, pornography. I yep. really can't. And it's something you have to unlearn. It's something you, a lot of times people need to be, to have deliverance ministry from. Yep. Um, because uh, it, it, there's an imprint there that's, that's a dark demonic imprint. Definitely. And, and it, it can really affect your sex life for the whole rest of your Absolutely. life. Absolutely. Yeah, and like Robin's saying is that, you know, and I read a study as we were preparing this week, um, pornography is actually more powerful than cocaine, crack, heroin, any drug. Pornography has a stronger imprint on our brains. And so when we give ourselves to pornography or we allow uh, pornography to come into our lives, you know, it awakens, it, it affects the dopamine in our brain. It definitely does. And the dopamine is the feel-good chemical, you know, and so we keep on repeating the cycle. And unfortunately, a lot of people go deeper and deeper and deeper into darkness of pornography um, if they aren't, you know, really sold out to Christ and say, nope, Lord, I'm struggling with this, and I want to be delivered, and I want to be free. And so anyway, um, so what we want to talk about today, guys, and if you're in your outlines, we want to talk about what the Bible, everybody say Bible. Bible. We want to talk about what does the Bible really say about sex. And we're going to talk about five specific things that the Bible teaches. The first one, if you're taking notes, is the fact that God created sex for what? Procreation and, circle the word and, enjoyment. God created sex for procreation and enjoyment. You know, uh, sex through the ages, you know, has uh, unfortunately, you know, if you take it through time, you know, when you, especially when you get to the Victorian age, sex became something that was just for procreation. It wasn't supposed to be at all for enjoyment, especially, I grew up Roman Catholic. And as a Catholic, <laughs> I hear somebody say, oh God. But as a Catholic, you were taught that sex is for procreation alone. And so, you know, like I said, I kind of came under that and, you know, had, didn't have any expectations, uh, but that it was for procreation, you were going to say. Well, I was just going to add a little bit for the Victorian age, because, you know, often things in our world and in different cultures are um, not the way that they seem. Um, those of you, many of you know that I have a Ph.D., and while I was studying for my Ph.D., um, I had to do some work on um, trauma. And so, uh, you know, Dr. Freud, who created um, the word hysterical, he did a lot, Sigmund Freud did an awful lot of work with women during the Victorian age. And what he found out is that at a certain age, um, they all, they would start screaming and uh, that's where he got hysterical from. And then, you know, he created what's the talking cure and all that. Um, part of my education is in um, psychology and in counseling and whatnot. But the point I wanted to bring is this. Um, 
during the Victorian age, it was very common for men, wealthy men, high status men of the elite class to give their daughters to their business associates and friends for sex. Wow. And so obviously that created a lot of trauma because those girls were raped by their business associates and men. And so Sigmund Freud did a 10 year study on these women. Now he actually, that's where he came up with hysteria because those women would become hysterical whenever he was going through the talking cure, right? When he was talking them through that. And so when he published the study, um, he was rejected by all of his colleagues because of the telling the truth about what the men did to their daughters. That's one of the things that's so hypocritical about the Victorian age. You know, they, they you know, sex was only for procreation, what da 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 but the men were raping their friends' daughters and were raping their, their own daughters. And so it was very systemic. It was very ugly in that culture. So they made um, the, all of the people in the profession that was brand new, you know, the, the whole thing of looking into someone's, you know what I mean, uh, psychology, that whole thing was brand new. It was a new, it was a new science. And so they didn't want the new science to show the truth. So Freud had to take out hmm. the true stories of the women um, and that, in order to publish right. his work. Now, a, a, a few years later, he put it back in because he did not like having to lie. But here's the point. Um, sex, the, the, you know, even during times when you were told that sex was not for, pro, it was only for procreation, um, what they were doing in all reality was right. uh, abusing sex and abusing women. Right. So the men had the fun and the women. Well, then that's just was part of the Victorian right. age. When it, that's And when you said that, I mean, that's a big part of my graduate work, you know, stuff that I did. And in trauma, that's, that's, you know, it's, it's one of those things that people uh, abuse, I think, almost more than anything else. For sure. Is, is sex. Yeah, no doubt. So let's uh, dive in because God's plan, his original intention, is for procreation, that sex would be for procreation and enjoyment. Everybody say enjoyment. Enjoyment. So Genesis 1, verses 27 through 30, we've been over this verse in this series uh, establishes God's pattern. So it says there, God created human beings reflecting his nature. He created them male and female. Everybody say male and female. Male and female. So in other words, there's not 30, 40, 50 genders. So there's two genders. There's male and female. Everybody say male, male and, and female. female. Then God blessed them. I want you to see this. God blessed them. So first he blesses them, and then he says, hey, go. Go, have fun. So God blessed them. So everybody, we want God's blessing on our sex life. Amen. God Amen. blessed them and said, prosper, reproduce, fill the earth. It's kind of like, you know, God is just saying, hey, listen, go for it. He's not the God that we, you know, and I like the Victorian age pictured, you know, the big sourpuss. So God blessed them and said, prosper, reproduce, fill the earth. Now listen to this. God looked over everything he had made, and it was, say it with me, good. good. So, so very, very good. good. I love that. It was good. So very good. And so the image of God's image, uh, picture of sex is that it's good, that it's for procreation and enjoyment. But the enemy has twisted it like he always does. He is the one who has perverted sex to be something God never intended to be. And to be, you know, the world pictures it as the, quote, dirty deed, but not God. Listen to this in 1 Timothy 6, 17, continuing the thought of for sex for enjoyment. Command those, Paul says, to Timothy, who are rich in this present world, not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. Can I get an amen? Amen. But to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything. Underline that. Say everything. Everything. For what? Our, For enjoyment. our enjoyment. Does that include sex? Absolutely. Yes. 
And so, again, you know, God, God says, yes, it's for procreation, but yes, it's for enjoyment. And I like these two words. If you're looking at your, at your outline, the word procreate means to start. The word recreate means to stir back up. And if you want to fill in your blank here, sex is not just for procreation, but for recreation. Recre the word, we get the word recreation. You know, C.S. Lewis, great <clears throat> thinker in the 50s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, he said, you know, sex is play for adults, you know. And so that thing of being re recreated in our soul where there's a recreation of intimacy with our partner, and where there's that connection, that's something that God has for us. So the first thing is, everybody say with me, God created sex for procreation and, and enjoyment. enjoyment. Second thing we learn from the Bible is that sex is reserved for marriage and marriage alone. Okay, so again, going back to Genesis 2, you know, we're talking about one man, one woman, hopefully for life, which as we talked about in the first week, and Rob and I are part of this statistic, 60% of people, unfortunately, have gone through a divorce uh, in the church, in the body of Christ. <clears throat> and so, you know, God's ultimate desire, though, is that it would be one man, one woman, hopefully for life. So, Genesis 2.24 says, For this reason, a man leaves his father and mother and attaches to his wife, and they become one flesh. So we see here a man, this is the, the original pattern, and it's God's way that will never, ever change. The man is to leave father, mother, leave the family of origin, and then cleave to his wife, and they begin a new family. And it, I like the fact that it says, and they become, because there's the process that implies there's a process to becoming one. It's not that it happens right away, but we're becoming one and becoming one flesh. And so, uh, <clears throat> Song of Solomon, do you have anything to say on Genesis 2? No, I'm good. Okay, so we go to Song of Solomon, and, and guys, I want to say, you know, most people, including Christians, don't realize what the Song of Solomon is for. The Song of, they, they spiritualize it, a lot of people spiritualize it, but it's not meant to be spiritualized. It, is, it was a book that the Hebrews uh, did not allow their uh, child to read until they became of married age, because it is a, the whole book is Solomon, you know, and he, was, he wrote songs. This is the greatest song that he wrote, and it's about physical intimacy. It's about uh, pursuing that person that you're called to be married to. And then, you know, what married love looks like, including sex. And so let's go to Genesis 4, verses 1 through 3. And so to set this up, uh, Solomon, in the first few chapters, we see that, you know, uh, he's pursuing her you know, she is in love with him. He's in love with her. In chapter 4, we come now, to... Now, this is in Song of Solomon. Song of 4, Solomon. Not Genesis. No, Song of Solomon. Yeah. I thought I said that. Song of Solomon 4. Okay. Uh, Song of Solomon 4, uh, we come where they have just been married. And so they are in, the, in, their, in their room, their bedroom, and they're about to have the first time of having sex. And so, you know, you, if you read Song of Solomon, you know, basically he's describing her as she is undressing, okay? And so, again, I sent you guys a text this week and said, this is going to be at least PG-13, maybe more. And so, here we go, all right? Buckle up your seatbelts. From this point in, it gets pretty intense. So, Song of Solomon 4, uh, and he starts, Solomon says to his bride, he says, How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. And he starts with up here. So she's obviously got a veil, and she's, he's pulling back the veil. He's looking at her eyes. He says, 
Your eyes behind your veil are doves like doves. Your hair, and he's looking at her hair, is like a flock of goats descending from the hills of Gilead. Now, in today's world, we would go, wow, that wouldn't do it for me. Can I say, can I get an amen, ladies? Yes, for sure. <laughs> that would not cut it. But you have to understand something. It was cultural for them. Well, it was cultural in the fact that in the area uh, of Gilead where they were, where they're, he's writing about, there was a certain um, uh, kind of goat that had beautiful black hair. They were known to be black-haired goats. And so when they'd be coming down, you know, the hill, you just see the sun shimmering off of the black, you know, the black hair that was so shiny and beautiful, which I've never seen a goat like that. But that's what he's implying <laughs> is that so obviously she has dark hair. And, and what I want you to get at, guys, is listen, we're about to get pretty intense, but this is what's important. You know, Solomon doesn't just, you know, I hate to say it, get on top and do his business. No. He affirms her. He starts speaking into her, you know, and as we're going to see, undoing things that she had believed about herself, insecurities about herself. And so, again, just repeating, he says, how beautiful you are, my darling. This is their married night. Oh, how beautiful. Your eyes behind your veil are doves. Your hair is like a flock of goats descending from the hills of Gilead. Your teeth, so he's going down, he's going to the teeth now, are like a flock of sheep just shorn. <clears throat> They're white, coming up from the washing. She obviously used mouthwash. Each, <laughs> each has its twin. Not one of them is alone. So in other words, all your teeth are there, thank God. So we know, listen, we know two things. We know two things. <laughs> is The first and thing is beautiful. obviously she wasn't a hockey player. And the second Bobby. thing that obviously she wasn't from Alabama. Dude. I said it. Boom. All right. It's a joke. Bad pastor, bad Bobby pastor. All right. Away. All right. <laughs> so... I love that verse. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep, just shorn, coming up from the washing. Each has his twin. Not one of them is alone. You're not a, you're not a toothless wonder. Bobby. All right, I'll stop. Your lips are like a scarlet ribbon. Your mouth is lovely. So he's just pouring into her. And, you know, it's interesting because, you know, in the first chapter, she says her brothers made fun of her because of how dark she was, because she had to work out in the vineyards. And so she was dark complected, and, and obviously she describes, you know, that she wasn't like the wealthy women that had soft porcelain skin. She had worked in the fields, and her skin was dark and tough, you know, probably cracked some. But what's he doing? He's pouring into her. He's affirming her. Listen, folks, it's so important. We talked about this last week. It's so important to pour in to each other, to speak words of affirmation. Because listen, from the time we are children, the enemy is seeking to tear us down, to tear us down, to tear down our self-image. And God wants to build that back up. So, And he does that in a big way through our spouses. So I want you to write this down, that we see here he's pouring into her. Emotional intimacy comes before physical intimacy. Let me say that again. Emotional intimacy comes before physical intimacy. And you'll see there, I like to say the word intimacy means into me you see. And, you know, I tell Robin all the time, you know, I tell her before I, you know, before we met, you know, I was praying for someone, a woman who, would truly be home, you know, a safe place, you know, where, where you, I was known and she was known to each other, you know, and I had a prophetic word by a friend of mine in the July before we met, and she said, you're going to meet somebody, she's, you're going to get her and she's going to get you, and so that thing of seeing into each other, unlike anybody else can, that's where intimacy comes from, and so Bottom line is, listen, we've got to take time to 
and Mac. Okay? Let me say it again. We have to take time to connect emotionally before we do so physically. Robin? Well, especially for women, um, I, <clears throat> a part of the intimacy means that there's trust there, um, especially if a woman has had uh, bad experiences and abusive experiences yep. where sex is concerned. And so if there's not emotional trust and emotional intimacy, then um, the, the, the act of having sex can feel robotic. It could also feel, even when it's not, um, something that, that her body is being used. Now, I'm not a man, so I'm speaking as a woman. I'm not saying that men don't have these same types of feelings, right, or thoughts. Um, but um, if you don't feel uh, safe around the person, um, then sometimes it's hard to have sex with that person, even if it's your spouse, because the, the trust, the be, you have to be able to trust that person with your heart yep. before you can trust them with your body. And so, and sex is such an important connection that um, it, it involves a deeper, deeper levels of trust. Definitely. I'm just looking at you and your teeth. I'm so glad that, that, you, that they have their twins. I'm so glad. Each tooth has its twin. Well, <laughs> actually, just... I've got, you know that I'm in the I middle know. of some dental work. Dental work. Yes. <laughs> anyway. So they really don't all have their twins. You just can't see it. Anyway. And you had to live with me for a long time, missing a front tooth at home. That's right. TMI. All right. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about uh, three intimacy builders. If I think it's on the back of your outline. Are you guys getting something so far? Good. You guys got to we we invite people because, listen, the, what we bring as a church, man, people need, guys. And, you know, this world is dying for hope. It and is. so I just want to encourage you, be an inviter. Yes. So, three intimacy builders, okay? And these are things that you basically saw with what Solomon was pouring into. Her name, she just goes by the Shulamite in the Song of Songs. But the first thing that we saw him doing is looking into her eyes. So, the first intimacy builder is looking into our partner's eyes when talking. And so, you know, that's that thing of that I really see you. You know, I see into you. The Bible says that the eyes are the window to the soul. And so Robin and I, we, we do take time. I mean, especially, you know, on Sunday afternoons, that's our time just to just relax and just hang out together after church. But we make a habit of looking in, into each other's eyes and really listening. Uh, and, you know, I, I think that's a big, big, huge part why we're able to keep connection. Yeah, but I will tell you, if, if I'm talking and he doesn't hear me, sometimes I physically take his head she physically and takes I turn my head it and, and turn it towards it. me because I'm like, I don't feel that you're hearing me or seeing me. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I don't do that in an aggressive way, but I'm like, hey, right. I'm talking. I am talking. Yeah, so um, the part behind that, remember when we talked about Aheva, the intentional act of loving? Um there's a lot of things that have to be intentional. And looking at each other when you're communicating uh, eye to eye t does tell the other person that you see them. Yep, it's good. <clears throat> so, first of all, looking into the eyes when talking, I see you listening without judgment, meaning I hear you. Now, let me say, this I do believe is harder for men than for women. I think women tend to be natural listeners. Uh, you know, most men, you know, uh, a lot of times if their wife is saying something, you know, <laughs> this is pretty recent for me, uh, or, you know, complaining about something, they take it personally. And so most men feel like, well, you know, they're almost like feeling they're attacked. And so they feel like they're being judged. Well, that's not necessarily the case. You know, like I said, women tend not to to do that. I, they can sometimes. But anyway, am I digging myself into a hole? No, no. Okay. It's just there are times, there are times when I am like complaining about something in life and I'll just, you know, venting, which we all do sometimes, and I'll have nothing to do with him and, I'm, and absolutely nothing to do with him. And then he'll be like, he'll get like upset and I'm like, what? 
Like, why are you upset? I was talking to God or just venting a natural frustration. This hadn't, doesn't have anything to do with you. you know, sometimes God, you know what I mean? God's the one who directs our lives. Sometimes he may direct me somewhere I don't think I want to go. <laughs> and I complain about it, right? And, but it's not about him. Um, but I think that that might come from taking too much responsibility on, which you had to do from the time you were a child. So yep. I think some of that behavior in Bobby comes from deep soul wounds, which yep. we all have. Yeah. Anyway, sure. this isn't um, a counseling session, but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> there are those, that, you know, those things inside of all of us that can sometimes color the way we perceive stuff. Yeah, for sure. So three intimacy builders. Uh, first, looking into eyes when talking. Second, listening without judgment. And then third, non-sexual touch. So we have look, hear, feel. And so touch is an important thing. You know, uh, we talked about a couple weeks ago about our love languages. And for both Robin and I, it's touch, physical touch. But, you know, again, non-sexual. Now, most men will go, say what? <laughs> like, I thought there wasn't, there wasn't anything but sexual touch, you know, that it leads to sex every time. No, no, it's not supposed to lead to sex every time. Sometimes, right. So. Uh, and I want to add something to that. One of the things that sometimes I ask Bobby for is a stress hug. Um, you know, do I do. I'm just like, can I just have a hug? Because it helps to melt the stress of the day off me. And it's, yep. just, a, it's just a really you know, nice hug, but I call it a stress hug, and that's it. Like, I need a stress hug. <laughs> yep. Because, you know, I have 175 students every day, and um, sometimes when I get home, I'm like, like help, put, help me, help. Especially me on stress Fridays. Hug. Yeah. Fridays is always a stress hug after school. But it's, that's what it's for. It's like, I'm, he's my best friend. You're, you're my yep. cover. Um, <laughs> help me, you know, give me some cover and let me feel you. Um, and it helps melt the stress of the day off. For sure. All right, so let's do a quick review. What the Bible says about sex. First, everybody say, God created sex. God created for procreation sex. Procreation and enjoyment. Mm -hmm. Second thing the Bible teaches, that say with me, sex is reserved for marriage and marriage alone. Third, everybody say it, sex, sex. starts way before the bedroom. It does. And then Fourth, if you want to write this down in your notes, sex can be passionate, but it can also be playful as well as planned. And so continuing on the Song of Songs, now we come into the nitty gritty. So Solomon has been admiring her in, in their marital, you know, bedroom. And, you know, he's been just pouring in words of affirmation. But now it's about to go further, as we'll see. So we jump from PG-13 to probably R here. Uh, and I, people say, this, I can't believe the Bible really says this. So Song of Solomon 4, verse 5. So again, he's working his way down from her eyes. He says, your breasts are like two fawns, like uh, female deer. Your breasts are like two fawns, like twin fawns of a gazelle that browse among the lilies. Now, what do uh, fawns, if you approach two fawns, let me ask you, how should you approach two fawns? Very gently, you know, very gently. Not, you know, like, you know, just attack, you know. I mean, like some guys, it's just like, you know, I don't even want to go there. It's the Bible says enough. We could go into some deep, deep waters. But the bottom line is, is that he's being gentle with her. Okay? And so I want you to write this down. Approach matters. Everybody say approach matters. And I want to add something here, um, especially for older women. And even younger women after you've had a baby. And if you've breastfed, your breasts are no longer like those fawns a lot of times, right? They change. Your body changes. Yep. And um, one of the things for me, and this was really hard when I married Bobby, is that I had um, a diagnosis and issues with breast cancer in 2004. And I had a bilateral mastectomy. I mean, I had my entire chest cut off. And so I have, I was 
blessed to have reconstruction, but but I have um, a lot of scars. Um, and, you know, it's not, I don't have the breast I was born with. Um, and I've really grieved that. Um, and, of course, as we get older, we don't have the breast we were born with. That's part of being a woman, having children, and you change. And I, it was really hard for me at first with Bobby because I didn't, I, I had a hard time. I was like, I told him, and I said, I have Frankenstein boobs, Bobby. Boy. I mean, you know, I did. There's like, No, I've no, I'm TMI. just saying. No, oh, it's not. Oh, Lord. No. Yeah. I, it's serious. And women have a hard time because our our body image changes as we get older. It's true. It's true and yeah. so being uh, that my breast had to be completely redone and they are not anything like they were when I was younger, that was a, something I had to deal with. And I guarantee you uh, a big part of a woman's, the way that a woman feels about her body is what her breasts are like. And after you have kids and all kinds of stuff, they change. And so I've had to really grapple, you know, that's a word, with that. Um, and I still grapple with that because that part of my feminine, femininity, that part of my womanhood is, is uh, very different and not something that I am still comfortable all the time with. And you know that. But I pour into you. You do pour yeah. into me, but I, that's just an honest fact. Right, and that's something that I'm not sure men. I I know that men are visual, I know that, and I also know what I bring to the table in every other way. But I also know that that bothers me a little bit, probably every time I don't have that I'm not fully covered. But, so but in I, being I always, honest with you and talking about ladies, that's a tough one. It is. I mean, and that's a big part of how we feel about ourselves, men. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Is no, that, I'm just, I'm not, yes, no critique of you. You do pour in. I do. You do. But for me, I'm just saying that's a big challenge. And I think it's also a challenge for men. Because, again, they, I, we have all these ideals of what, this is what is beautiful and sexy in our culture. And um, if you're ever that way, which is, like, not very often for any woman, right? Because nobody, we aren't made um, to look like a cookie cutter person on a magazine. Um, but especially when reality of life and we have babies and this happens and that happens, and we, the further we get away from that ideal and the visual men in our culture that still see that ideal, it can, there's a disconnect there Right. that needs to be sometimes talked about and met. Yeah. And let me just say, men can have man boobs. So anyway, uh, <laughs> we've gone this far. We've gone this far. Let's just go right over the edge. All right. I think that was a really important point. It to is make. important. It is important. Okay. So, uh, Song of Solomon 4, verse 6. So, we see there that sex can be passionate, which we talked about. Uh, and then it can also be playful. And so, verse 4, or verse 6 in chapter 4, until the day breaks, so they're taking their time exploring each other's bodies and the shadow shadows flee i will go to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of incense i'll let you figure that one out he's gone from the breast downward and i'll just say hey it's in the bible okay it is in the bible so he says until the day breaks so you know obviously he was a stud you know we're talking all night long that was an acdc song i think until the day breaks and the shadows flee, I will go to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of incense. And then verse 15, she's now speaking, the Shulamite, and she says, Awake, north wind, and come, south wind. Blow on my garden that its fragrance may spread everywhere. Let my beloved come into his garden and taste its choice fruits. Now let me just say, uh, you can probably figure out you know, if you think about what this verse is saying, but most commentators believe that this is a, um, a nod toward oral sex. I know it's controversial, but the bottom line is it's pretty much hard to read this. And, you know, he's basically going from top to bottom. And so, man, I can't believe how uncomfortable this is for me. Gosh, man. Anyway, 
Uh, and let me just say, guys, when it, when it, when, in regards to what is okay, you know, in sex, there's a one simple rule. And I believe that rule is that both people are comfortable with whatever it is. So there's not a forcing of yourself on what you want onto the other person, usually a man to a woman. But there's agreement and uh, there's both enjoy whatever it is. Would you say that's? Yeah, yeah, okay. there definitely needs to be agreement. Okay, yeah. so let's move on. So I love this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. <clears throat> so you see a playfulness here. So sex can be passionate. It can also be playful. And so he says, he's speaking, he says, you are slender like a palm tree and your breasts are like clusters of its fruit. I said, I will climb the palm tree and take <laughs> hold of that fruit. I mean, it's in the Bible. There we go. I mean, you know, it's like I'm going to climb up that palm tree and I'm going to play with that fruit. And so, you know, that's it. So anyway, again, you know, and listen, guys, in all seriousness, I, what we want you to get is that God really does care about our sex life. That's he, why the he song, created sex. He created yeah. sex. But that's why he made sure that a whole book called Song of Songs was included in the Bible to show that this is something that he cares about. And it's not something that's bad or that is just, you know, belongs to the world. No, God originated it. This comes from God and it's something he wants us to enjoy. So verse 7 of chapter 8, again, we looked at that sex can be passionate, it can be playful. And it can be planned. Verse 7 of chapter 8, he says, Come, my love, let us go out to the country and spend the night among the wildflowers. So basically, let's get a hotel out in the country and just focus on each other. And I just want to say, listen, you know, it is so important, especially in your child-rearing years. It is so important to get away from the routine of your everyday life, your work, and everything else, get away a night or two to where you can totally focus on each other and your relationship. You know, Robin and I try to do that, you know, at least a couple times a year, you know, because that's just it. Listen, it's easy to lose connection. It's very easy to lose connection. All right, so we have talked about, go ahead. You know. Well, the way our world is structured and the way our culture is structured, um, it's uh, because it's such a fast-paced world, and there's so much going on, and especially in these days where there's so much unpredictability. Um, again, um, with the word "aheva," love that is action-oriented and intentional, sex has to be action-oriented and yep. intentional. I don't. Um, when you're younger, it can come out of just passion, but as you get older, and life comes into the picture so often. Um, it's, it has to be more of an intentional thing yep. that you do. Um, so, uh, but when you lose that, you lose that part of each other, that part of giving to each other, it can put your marriage on, um, uh, it can make it more fragile and put For it sure. in, a, in a place that it might be easier to break. For sure. All right, so quick review. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm Give using up. yours to review. Yeah. But, okay, yeah. so quick review, wait, and then we're going to finish wait. up with the last point. Okay. Okay, okay so quick review. God created sex for procreation and enjoyment. First thing the Bible teaches. Second, that sex is reserved for marriage and marriage alone. Third, and, go ahead. Well, remember last week when I said I think God put it inside of marriage because it is so strong and it's such a strong connection. And um, there are commentators and people that talk about it being a soul connection. Yep. You can have the deepest wound possible from sexual experiences. For sure. um, so if it's put in the most safe relationship he ever created, which is a covenant that helps to protect the people inside the relationship because sex can cause such pain as yep, well. For sure. So uh, sex is reserved for marriage, marriage alone. Third, sex starts way before the bedroom. Then we just talked about sex can be passionate. It can be playful as well as planned. And then finally, and we've learned this, sex is spiritual warfare. Now, a lot of people say, what? Pastor Bobby, what are you talking about? Well, listen, guys, 
We're going to see this in this verse that we're not just limited to praying together as a way of, of spiritual warfare against our enemy. You know, the Apostle Paul writes here in 1 Corinthians 7 that sex, coming back together, joining yourselves, is a form of spiritual warfare. Paul says, do not deprive each other of sex except perhaps only occasionally by mutual consent and for a limited time of fasting and prayer. So he's not talking about losing connection for months, even years, which can happen. He's saying that it should be a regular thing and except perhaps at times for mutual consent for a limited time by a fasting and prayer. And then he says, then come together again. So he's talking about sexually. Come together again so that Satan will not have his way. So just as God has a plan for your physical intimacy that he wants for life, to be enjoyed for life, the enemy, the enemy is against you connecting. That's what Paul's saying. He says, Satan, let get together again so Satan won't have his way. And so the enemy wants to destroy that intimacy. And so it's vital. I mean, we pray against the spirit of strife almost every day, you know, in our church, in our marriage, uh, because we suffered, you know, in previous relationships, you know, when the enemy comes in and brings strife. So I love what Tim Keller, as we finish up here, this quote, he says, sex as prescribed in the Bible is a way of saying I see all of your imperfections and I am still completely, exclusively, and permanently committed to you. You are naked to me in all ways and I still accept you forever. And so, again, you know what, as Robin was saying, marriage has its seasons, you know, and, you know, we go in and out. There's springtime with the, you know, the freshness, the newness, then there's, you know, the summer where it's hot and passionate. Then you got autumn where things start to come in and not everything looks, you know, it looks on the outside hunky-dory, but not everything's okay inside. And then winter where it can be very, very cold. And like Robin said, you know, when there's not the intimacy, it takes just a little, the little twig can break so easily. But we can, we, if we're mature, we understand that our marriages go in and out of those seasons and it's like if we're committed to enduring every season of life, we're going to have prevailing marriages that I do believe can enjoy sex until really till we hit the grave. Yeah. I'm telling you, but I, it has I to believe be, it. Again, it has to be intentional. And I, I really, I just want to say one more thing. And I know that um, we could do a whole teaching on, on the, the uh, evils of pornography. But one of the things, and like Bobby talked about, with all the dopamine and everything like that, you know, I'm, I've known, I've had conversations with people in the past, and I remember one particular person, and he was a man, and he said, it's just a whole lot easier. He said, it's a whole lot easier than me having to have sex. I don't want to, he said, so yeah, well, he just said, I don't want to go through all that. He said, that takes way too much time. And his poor wife, right? takes way too much time, and I don't want to put all that effort into it. It can just take a few minutes for me, and I'm fine. And um, again, remember that that is not real. It's not real. Um, it, it gives a, a false, uh, it gives a, you do have the dopamine high, but it's still a false type of high from having, because there's no intimacy, right. and there's it no robs you of the real gift that sex and intimacy are. It's so much stronger. Um, your relationship is so much more beautiful and stronger when you do have sexual relation, uh, relations with each other and have that intimacy there. Um, and so, again, I just wanted to remind you that uh, pornography seems like an easy way to get that high, but it's a complete buster of intimacy and yep. reality the way God intended it to be. True. I'm proud of you. You do a good job. You did a great job. Didn't you do a good job? Thank you. She really did. Good job. Thank you. All right, guys. So uh, I want to say two things as we finish. Is number one is the past is the past. Everybody say the past is the past. The past is the 
past and is it's past. under the blood of Christ. It is, thank God. So we're not to look backward. We're only to look forward, pressing into the future. So did you guys get equipped, whether single, married? Absolutely. Yes. What's well, in the Word of God, man? So, so guys, yeah. let's uh, let's. I'm going to ask Robin to close in prayer, I will. and then we'll give the blessing. One of the things that I'm reminded of when you say you're talking about the past, Joyce Meyer, who's somebody that I love, and whenever I have time, I watch her stuff. Right? Um, she she has she says what ha what will happen if you always look in the rearview mirror? If you're driving and always looking in the rearview mirror, what's going to happen with you? Smash into a car. You're going to you're going to have a wreck. Right. And so you have to look forward, right? That's a great analogy for me. And yeah. I've never forgotten it since she said it, that if you're always looking in the rearview mirror when you're driving, man, you're going to have a wreck because you aren't looking at what's in forward and ahead of you. Yeah. And there's, uh, God always has good things. God can redeem everything. I, don't, I still don't know how he's going to redeem everything in my life, but I've seen him redeem some stuff. And it's been amazing how he's worked. Yep. Good. Pray. Father, we just come to you this morning with grateful and thankful hearts. Thankful that we have the right, you know, we still have the freedom and the right to be able to be in church and worship you freely without being having to run from the law and being locked down. We thank you for everyone that's in our service, all of our staff. We thank you for everyone who works so hard to make the bridge work. And we thank you for the beautiful worship that Alan brought this morning. Yes. But mostly we thank you for your Holy Spirit that is alive and present and that is and has been ministering to all of us in our own special way today. Thank you for your word, Father, that is truth and edifying, and that teaches us the way to be, and that helps us to have a guide in the storm and the mess in which we live in in a fallen world. And we just thank you, Father, mainly for you and our salvation, and that your blood has cleansed us all from any sin we ever have committed or will commit, from all unrighteousness. And mostly thank you that when you look at me, you look at us, you see your son. We praise and thank you for this and for the gift of marriage and of sex and all the beautiful things. Thank you for the gift of my Bobby and just all the beautiful things he's brought into my life. And we just thank you, Father, for this new day and another day to live, love, and worship you and love and laugh together with each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, guys, let's stand up and we'll finish with the blessing. Next Sunday, uh, I'm going to be starting uh, the series Mastermind, and we're going to be focusing on your thought life. And uh, I know most of us need, you know, to be equipped in our thought life, because as our thoughts go, so goes our life. So uh, if you want to open up your hands to the Lord like this, just very simple. It's just saying, I receive, Father, I bless your people this day. In the mighty name of Jesus, those here physically, those watching online, and I declare, may the Lord God bless you, and may the Lord God protect you and your loved ones this very week. May the Lord God smile upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord God show you His favor in everything you do, and may He give you His peace as only he can give. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Let's give God praise, guys. Hey, how do we like to finish? We got prayer teams up here, uh, Alan and Angie. How do we like to finish? We say, he who finds God finds life. God bless you guys.